Hello, everyone. And on behalf of the Institute of the Humanities and Global Cultures at the University of Virginia, a very warm welcome to our audiences in the United States and from around the world. I'm Devjani Ganguly, a literary historian and the director of the Institute, and have great pleasure in welcoming you and our Institute's spring distinguished visitor, Dr. Carlo Cariff, to our year-long lecture series on futurities. Dr. Cariff is our third speaker in the series on futures. We have hosted the novelist Amitabh Ghosh and Professor Sarah Natal from the University of Witwatersrand these past months. The series features humanists, scientists, writers, artists, and policymakers who explore burning questions about our unfolding futures in the age of technological intensification and climate change. How we live and die together as individuals, collectives, organisms, and species has emerged as urgent in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic. The pandemic in many respects has been read as a mass experiment in social control and social compliance. It appears to have dissolved familiar modes of sociability and community building in an ethos of survival. What happens to our social worlds when we are all seen as potential disease vectors? When social distancing becomes a sacrificial form of solidarity? These questions are not unrelated to the larger technoplanetary and existential issues that we have been exploring these past weeks. The key question that many of us have asked is why the world has struggled to contain the coronavirus outbreak despite phenomenal advances in epidemiology, immunology, medicine, pharmacology, and biotechnology. The struggle reveals paradoxes and indeterminacies, human and non-human, that lie at the heart of a viral pandemic of such magnitude. If viruses are so intimately entangled in the web of life, what does it mean to defeat a malevolent virus like COVID-19 that is destined to become part of our genetic and evolutionary history? What really is at stake in contemplating our own unprecedented geological agency in agitating the earth and unleashing pandemics that are all but imminent? So at once a sign of our catastrophic present, our mythic past and our evolutionary history, viral pandemics such as COVID-19 plumb the depths of human habitation on this planet. They bring to life questions of contagion and immunity, purity and contamination, cohabitation and social fragmentation, and moral regeneration in the face of devastation. Today, we are fortunate to have with us the medical anthropologist, Dr. Carlo Cadiff, to shed light on these key questions. Dr. Cadiff is a reader in the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine at King's College London, where he also serves as the Director of Postgraduate Research and Chair of the Culture, Medicine and Power Research Group. His work explores global health at the intersection of science, medicine, media and the state. And he's the author of an influential book that many of us read these, uh, in, in, during the pandemic. His book is called The Pandemic Perhaps, Dramatic Events in a Public Culture, published in 2015. Dr. Kharif is an affiliate of King's India Institute and visiting faculty at the Graduate Institute at Geneva. His current research investigates the changing landscape of oncology and cancer treatment in India. He traveled to Mumbai in January 2020 to begin a new ethnographic project on cancer in India. He rented an apartment and set everything up to begin his work. And then COVID-19 struck India and the world. A lockdown was declared by Prime Minister Modi, and he ended up living in India these past two years, witnessing the pandemic and thinking and writing about it. His talk today, The Social and Social Distancing, Rethinking Stigma, will be based partly on his research and experience of the unfolding pandemic. Please welcome Carlo Kadev. Thank you so much, uh, Devjani, for this uh, very kind introduction. And, and thanks to the Institute for, for the invitation. It's such a great uh, pleasure to be here and to share uh, some of my work and, and my experiences that I made over the past two years. So today I want to talk about stigma 
And uh, my presentation has three parts. Each part is about 15 minutes long. And the first two parts are more conceptual. So I hope you will bear with me. And then in the third part, I will discuss and present some of the materials from uh, India. And so you'll get to hear more about the uh, COVID-19 pandemic and the response to it. Um, so in this presentation, I want to think about um, the ways in which scientific research creates a future for itself. My focus will be on health research, an international and interdisciplinary field of scientific investigation concerned with pressing questions of illness and disease. I will anchor my intervention today in a topic that has been at the heart of a substantial amount of health research over the past two decades, stigma. Drawing on science and technology studies, and that is to say scholarship in the humanities and the social sciences that has an interest in the politics of knowledge, I want to address two questions that are closely related. First, how does health research think stigma? And second, what in turn is the role of stigma for health research? I will argue that mainstream health research has objectified stigma to such an extent that the concept has no future, if by future we mean an open horizon. But this is not necessarily a problem. On the contrary, it is precisely because the concept doesn't have a future that it makes the social reproduction of research possible. I will call this the paradoxical status of stigma as a foundational concept in contemporary health research. So this is a case study, but I believe it has broader implications and broader relevance for more general questions about the future of science and the politics of knowledge. There is ever more pressure on scientists to be useful, generate output, and produce knowledge that can be applied and implemented. In such an environment, the social reproduction of science cannot be taken for granted anymore as a matter of fact. The result, the result of this are fields of scientific research that, in order to secure a future for themselves, increasingly operate with standardized concepts that lack an open future, that lack an open horizon and therefore a future. As we shall see, stigma is not simply an object of research. It is a concept that operates as a standard. And that means it determines the rules of knowledge production, reduces the risk of discursive dissonance and enables streamlined collaboration across communities of practice. The interoperability of the concept has many advantages, but it comes at a significant risk. And in this presentation, I take stigma as my case, but I invite you to consider possible resonances in other domains of contemporary knowledge production. So let me start with uh, the first part. In July 2020, The Lancet published an article on stigma during the COVID-19 pandemic that raised the alarm about a serious threat to healthcare workers and patients who are facing stigma and discrimination all over the world. The piece referred to a public declaration released by the International Committee of the Red Cross about the current situation of violence against healthcare, which emphasized that many pandemic responders are now experiencing harassment, stigmatization, and physical violence. According to the declaration, each day brings new stories of intimidation and harm. The Lancet article relied on anecdotal evidence drawn from newspaper articles and interviews with healthcare professionals to illustrate examples of stigma associated with the pandemic. 
Like other publications, it presented short, sharp narratives, evoking scenes of everyday life that made the problem concrete and relatable. The patient who is abandoned by the family, refused in the shop and harassed on social media. The doctor who is denied access to public transportation, insulted in the park and evicted from the neighborhood. Despite claiming to describe a problem common all over the world, almost all examples mentioned in the article were based in the South. According to the Lancet, patients and healthcare workers in Mexico, Malawi, India, and Zimbabwe are facing substantial stigma because of the, quote, baseless beliefs and, quote, improper understandings of the common masses. Now, the situation in the North was different. As a doctor based in Kent explained in the article, in the UK, we were fortunate not to have stigma. Only certain parts of the world seemed to witness stigmatization of patients and healthcare workers during the pandemic. These places were in urgent need of proper health education, as it were, to scientifically destigmatize COVID-19. A review of scholarly publications and gray literature suggests that the idea of the South as a location of extensive stigmatization has quickly become global common sense in COVID-19 health research and policy. The majority of COVID-19 stigma studies focus on countries outside of Europe and North America. These studies come with sweeping claims that naturalize the object of study. Take, for example, a piece published in Frontiers in Public Health focusing on India. Drawing on newspaper articles as its main source of evidence, it claims that, quote, the COVID-19 pandemic has been instrumental in creating a dramatic shift from people's need to live in mutual association toward the desire to stigmatize distinctive others, end of quote. Here, I want to pause and take a step back from such statements that naturalize and generalize the problem. Instead, I want to examine the stigma alarm, focusing in particular on the ways in which scientific stigma discourse constructs its object. I argue that stigma has become a foundational concept in health research and policy that increasingly operates as a discursive black box. As an axiomatic term, stigma has reached a level of recognizability that makes it possible for the concept to be applied with little reflection to almost any kind of negative social experience. Stigma is hardly a marginal subject today. A bibli bibliometric study of publications on stigma found 17,000 156 articles, reports, and reviews in 682 journals published over the past two decades, with a steady annual increase since 2008. My own web of science search produced over 50,000 results, an even higher outburst of publications. Most of the papers that examine health-related forms of stigma appeared in journals either focused on psychiatry and mental health or in academic outlets with a more general interest in public health. Stigma is of particular interest in psychiatry and mental health because it is perceived as a cause of psychological problems such as stress, anxiety, shame, and depression. The psychological consequences of stigma are important to be sure, but the concept matters in mainstream health research more generally because of the structural role of stigmatization as a barrier to health-seeking behavior, engagement in care, and adherence to treatment. Scholars argue that processes of stigmatization undermine medical interventions and thus represent a major driver of poor health outcomes globally. Stigmatization harms people, 
but it also interferes with the therapeutic project of medicine. A key motivation of stigma research is to remove obstacles, ease access to healthcare, improve commitment and compliance, and make medicine more effective. This means that as an overarching term, stigma refers to that part of the social and the cultural that threatens the therapeutic project of medicine and that is presumably responsible for poor health. So stigma is a key site of engagement for health researchers with an interest in the social and the cultural. But it is not just a key site. It is also a prime example of how medically trained health researchers tend to envision the social and the cultural. In this type of research, the social and the cultural appear as that which deters and derails the therapeutic effort of medicine, preventing medical interventions from achieving the aim of making a difference and improving health. Social and cultural forces interfere with public health programs and medical interventions, and thus create structural obstacles for the health and well being of the population. It is extremely rare to find health studies that do not start from the presumption of the social and the cultural as a world of obstructions that undermine the good intentions of health professionals. This inherent negative perception is also embedded in the concept of social determinants of health, insofar as the focus of the research is often on those factors that impact health in an adverse way. The idea of stigma embodies, in emblematic fashion, the modernist assumption of the social and the cultural as that which is outside of science and medicine, and thus constitutes a problem for projects that are based on rational modes of thought and action. While most publications examine stigma in relation to specific medical conditions, from schizophrenia to HIV AIDS, tuberculosis, lep leprosy, obesity, epilepsy, depression, and more recently COVID-19, the current trend is to advocate for a generic use of the concept to capture a variety of stigmatized health conditions in very diverse cultures. The hope is that a generic concept and approach will facilitate measurement and intervention. However, a consequence of this call for generalization is that stigma is increasingly used freely and widely in the context of a whole range of medical conditions, suggesting that the variety of phenomena are collapsed into a singular world. The main epistemological function of the term is to capture experiences, feelings, and perceptions by means of a label. Stigma is predominantly used as a classificatory term in scholarly publications. Given that stigma itself operates on the basis of classification and labeling, this suggests that the object of research has become the method. In this idea of classification as a mode of explanation lies perhaps its immense appeal for health research and policy often driven by the quest for simple, generalizable tools with instant recognizability and universal applicability. Stigma is a concept that comes with a promise of immediate intelligibility. In health research and policy, stigma appears as a shorthand label for negative experiences, feelings, and perceptions of people who are suffering from or are associated with particular pathologies. What the term loses in terms of specificity and analytic precision, it gains in terms of applicability, comparability, and generalizability. I suggest that the term and its citability, its capacity to circulate across disciplinary boundaries and create a sense of understanding about the social and cultural causes of poor health might tell us more about the nature of health research and policy in our age of knowledge mass production 
than about stigma as such. Any engagement with stigma today requires critical awareness of the exceptional value of stigma as a generative interoperable term that has secured its prominent place in contemporary knowledge production because of systematic standardization. So the key aim of my presentation today is to decenter the concept of stigma and approach it as a question rather than an answer. What is stigma talk doing? What is the politics of stigma talk? I examined the black box of stigma in health research from different angles to illuminate both the capacities as well as the limitations of this master concept. This strategy highlights the risks of generalization and will allow us to re-enter problems of social suffering and social violence with less preconceived ideas and assumptions and a more open sensibility for the study of social negativity. So let me start with the question of how health research constructs its object of interest. So I will move on now to this, the second part, which tries to outline in more detail um, how health researchers understand stigma. At the very beginning of object construction is concept definition. Most publications start with a discussion of definitions and reference Erwin Goffman's classic 1963 book, which made stigma popular as a term. For Goffman, Goffman stigma refers to the situation of the individual who is disqualified from full social acceptance. Stigma in Goffman's view is a general feature of social life and thus inevitable and universal. His key interest is in interaction and identity. And that is to say in the ways in which stigmatized individuals deal with the dynamics of quote, shameful differentness. The engagement with government stigma notes on the management of spoiled identity engendered a distinct tradition of thought characterized by first, generalization of the term across a variety of settings. Two, naturalization of the normal abnormal distinction. Three, erasure of the roles of history and power. And four, emphasis on interaction and identity. So these are the key legacies of Goffman's work, which is deeply rooted in liberal political philosophy, a philosophy and a commitment that continues to energize contemporary stigma research. So definitions of stigma typically emphasize that stigma is a social process or related personal experience characterized by exclusion, rejection, blame, or devaluation that results from experience or reasonable anticipation of an adverse social judgment about a person or group identified with a particular health problem. It is important to note that the majority of health researchers have been much more interested in the personal experience than the social process. This is partly due to the medical perspective that animates this kind of work and the difficulty of moving beyond modes of inquiry that are focused neither on the individual nor on the population. The key aim of most research is to determine whether a person or a group of people have experienced stigma or feel stigmatized due to a specific health issue that constitutes them as different from other people. Now the difference at stake is a medical one and therefore presumably real because it is based on scientific facts. As a result, it cannot be questioned as a contingent historical construction. To see people as carriers of disease 
and to understand disease as deviation from the norm has become so common in our medical culture that it is hard to abandon. To do so would in fact mean to undermine the epistemological foundation of health research itself. Health research must thus find the reason for stigma somewhere else, outside of a medical culture that identifies people with their disease and that defines disease as that which is not normal. Stigma cannot be based on the same epistemological foundation, the foundation that makes health research possible. What both share in common must thus be obscured. The result are projections that locate the conditions which make stigma possible in the social and the cultural, and thus outside of the strictly scientific and rational. This may explain why there is little interest in stigma as a process. There's no attention to grammars of difference that have their own genealogies and that are themselves the result of broader systems of knowledge and power. There's also more importantly, no sense of how stigma research inadvertently naturalizes and dehistoricizes the recoding of these grammars of difference along the normal abnormal distinction. Modern stigma requires this recoding of difference. Goffman universalized it when he called stigma a general feature of social life. Conquillium refused it in his historical account of the normal and the pathological when he emphasized that difference is not disease. The focus on the people who experience stigma reflects an underlying medical psychological orientation focused on diagnosis. What is the problem? Who is affected by it? And how common is it? This means that stigma functions in health research as a diagnostic category, based on the assumption that there are definitionally specific entities that can be described and identified with precision. As Charles Rosenberg noted, the practice of diagnosis labels, defines, and predicts, and in doing so, helps constitute and legitimate the reality that it discerns. The definition of the concept enables the identification and classification of distinct personal experiences as stigma. The medical psychological orientation of health research informs the construction of stigma as an object. This type of orientation is also explicit in the kind of language that health researchers employ. For example, many publications are concerned with the incidence, severity, prevalence, and burden of stigma. This epidemiological terminology frames stigma as itself a kind of pathology. Stigma here appears as a social analog of disease. We might just say that stigma follows disease like a shadow, both epistemologic, epistemologically because it is conceptualized as itself a kind of disease and chronologically as a secondary phenomenon affecting those who are associated with a disease. Take for, take for example, an article published in 2020 in the International Journal of Community Medicine and Public Health on stigma and apprehensions related to COVID-19 among healthcare professionals in Delhi. The study called stigma a secondary epidemic that followed the COVID-19 pandemic on its heels. Similar to other accounts, stigma is seen as a problem predominantly lo located in the South in developing countries like India, where presumably proper medical understanding is lacking and where information, misinformation about disease abounds. We can see here that from the very start, everything is already given. The problem, the reason for its existence, and the proper way of solving it. Like many other studies, the article starts with the foundational assumption of, of the stigma literature. Public health emergencies during pandemics of communicable disease may cause fear, leading to social isolation and stigma. So what is the foundational assumption here? Diseases can cause stigma. 
This is the starting point that motivates the research. It has been shown that stigma can happen. We know that stigma has happened in other cases. So the idea that stigma can happen is evidenced by reference to prior studies that show that it has happened for other diseases. It is additionally evidenced by the assumption that it is common for people to stigmatize due to fear of disease and lack of knowledge. As one study put it, stigma is common during pandemics where people blame others to soothe their fear. The assumption here is that stigma is common in the sense of being frequent and that it is natural in the sense of representing a universal psychological response mechanism. We can see here how this approach naturalizes stigma and how it situates the problem outside of the rational world of scientific medicine. The key question for this type of research then becomes, given that stigma can happen, did stigma occur in the case under investigation? The majority of health-related related stigma studies are aimed at confirming whether stigma happened or not. This constitutes the gap of knowledge that needs to be addressed. There is a dearth of literature with regards to the nature and magnitude of this stigma. We are here firmly in the territory of normal science in Thomas Kuhn's sense of the term. Under conditions of normal science, research involves generating evidence to confirm what is already assumed to be the case. This leads to a process of endless data accumulation with little movement in the kinds of questions that are asked and the sorts of problems that are addressed. Stigma research today is caught in a recursive process that is largely aimed at confirming its own paradigm. The study on stigma among healthcare professionals in Delhi is one among many other examples. It concludes that 70% of the participants in the study perceived some kind of stigma during the coronavirus pandemic. Considering potential explanations for this observation, the authors suggest that this high burden of stigma can be attributed to the existence, existent lacunae in the knowledge among the general population regarding the disease transmission and uncertainty in the outcome due to the novel nature of the disease. Without any evidence, the study claims that lack of knowledge is responsible for the secondary epidemic of stigma. However, the lack of knowledge that is foundational here is located in the study itself rather than in the people who are accused of stigmatizing healthcare workers. Who in fact are these people who stigmatize others? Given that they have not been part of the study, how can the authors know anything about their motivations? Here, as in so many other accounts, the classification of an experience or event as stigma automatically authorizes a template explanation that can be deployed in the absence of evidence. The act of classification suggests that the thing that has been labeled as stigma has been understood because it belongs to a broader group of things that are similar and that are already well known and well studied. The concept of stigma does not describe and explain an experience or event. Stigma is a concept that works as a name. Its aim is to fix and stabilize the referent. This also means that in this type of research, experiences and events are never given the opportunity to challenge the concept. As we can see here, under conditions of normal science, the object of research is taken for granted, the research process is aimed at stabilizing it, and the fundamental questions are assumed to have been already answered. The study concludes with suggestions for measures to curb the fear and dispel misinformation to prevent further stigmatization. Similar to other studies, the state is called on to address the problem and reduce stigma by promoting health education and disseminate, quote, correct knowledge regarding disease transmission 
transmission among the general public, along with interrupting the flow of rumor and misinformation. The template understanding of stigma as caused by false perception assumes that stigma occurs because people lack the correct scientific understanding of disease and therefore engage in negative social behavior towards people. However, this approach is fundamentally misleading. As I have suggested, stigma shares with health research the same epistemological foundation that identifies people with their disease and that envisions disease as a deviation from the norm. Stigma in its modern form is medicine's mirror. The appeal of the understanding of stigma as social behavior that is based on false perception derives from the fact that health researchers are already equipped with a solution for the problem, education and awareness. As one study notes, information-based interventions are the most common approach to addressing public stigma against any condition. Today, there is a strong desire and urgency to address social problems, implement solutions, and improve health outcomes. In the case of stigma, the solution, education and awareness, already exists. It only needs to be executed in programs. Information-based interventions notes one study, try to fill gaps in knowledge about the condition and dispel myths and demonstrate that stereotypes are often not true. Significantly, significantly these information-based interventions confirm health research as itself a useful and relevant endeavor. Health researchers generate information which can be used to solve the problem of stigma because stigma itself is considered an information problem. The assumption is that the right kind of information will improve attitudes and change negative stereotypes. In this approach to solution, information, education and awareness frames the problem. This means that from an epistemological point of view, the solution comes before the problem, a problem that it frames recursively in its own image. This inverted structure is a typical symptom of a research endeavor that has entered a phase of normal science. The strong disciplinary commitment of health researchers and policymakers to information, education, and awareness corresponds with the perception of the problem of stigma as a problem of information. But is stigma really a problem of information? I will return to this uh, question in the last part of this presentation. For now, I just want to know that the co-construction of the science and its object centered around the problematic of information entails a politics of difference. Scholars use stigma as a label to expose negative social behavior that is assumed to be based on a false perception of disease. In the literature, the other, unenlightened, uneducated, illiterate is called out for engaging in harmful behavior towards people afflicted with disease. At the heart of stigma as a side of knowledge production is a politics of epistemic difference that sets scholars apart from people who are presumably less enlightened and who are duped by baseless rumors, rumors and misleading information. Significantly, the politics of epistemic difference reappears geographically in the perception of the South as a place burdened with intense stigmatization due to lack of modern scientific education. Not surprisingly for a field of research that is operating on the conditions of normal science, most studies confirm the existence of stigma. The standardization of stigma research and the focus on naming and counting makes the results and the conclusions predictable. This means that this type of research has reached a level of coherence and consolidation, that it now mainly follows its own logic, independent of the world that it aims to investigate. Stigma in today's health literature has become an archetype, a common mode of thinking that allows scholars to turn almost any negative social experience associated with disease into a copy 
of the same type for which there is a template explanation and a template solution. So with this, I conclude the second part, which was uh, uh, the more conceptual one. And I'm now moving into the, the third part, um, drawing on some of my research in India. Uh, and so you will get to hear more about the pandemic uh, response and how that might be connected with the question of stigma. Uh, and this part is uh, titled Erasures. So in the second part of this presentation, I want to examine the stakes of stigma research under conditions of normal science. I will draw on scenes of social dissonance, irritation and harassment in the context of the coronavirus pandemic in India. Conceptually, I am moving from an attention to constructions to a concern with erasures that these constructions generate. I have already outlined one important erasure in terms of how health research contributes to the unseeing of modern med medicine's complicity in the making of stigma. The empirical materials on which I draw here are based on interviews with hospital staff in Tata Memorial Hospital, the oldest and largest public cancer, uh, cancer center in India, as well as on participant observation in Mumbai, where I have been living for the past two years. To keep the hospital running and protect the staff and patients, Tata Memorial created a COVID-19 action group constituted by clinicians and paramedics and nurses to coordinate the pandemic response. The focus in my account is on hospital staff, both medical and non-medical, firefighters, technicians, security personnel, janitors, ward boys, doctors, nurses, lab workers, researchers, administrators, plumbers, and gardeners. The focus therefore is not just on healthcare workers as such, but on the entire range of hospital staff, including those at the bottom of the hierarchy of occupations. This will help us decenter the idea of the hospital as a purely medical institution where everyone is either a doctor, a nurse, or a patient. What kinds of social negativity have staff, both medical and non-medical, experienced in their personal and professional lives during the pandemic? Can these experiences be captured with a master concept of stigma? What is at stake in shifting the frame of analysis beyond the stigma concept? Now, Mumbai is a particularly significant location for an anthropological inquiry into social disturbances and disruptions because the city is known for its long and at times very violent history of conflict around questions of residence, housing, work, and settlement. This includes more than a century of contestations over urban space, including government attempts to regulate the extreme proximities that are characteristic of the slums, shanty towns, and working class tenements of the metropolis. How are pandemic policies implemented by local authorities in the name of infectious disease control, situated within often already fraught borders and boundaries between communities and their everyday practices of relationality? Who is allowed to live, work, eat, sleep, and die proximate to whom? Who is supposed to be at distance from whom? These are not new questions for Mumbai, on the contrary but they take on a new tone and urgency in the current context. The government response to the coronavirus pandemic in India was characterized by one of the strictest and most severe lockdowns in the world. With rigorous bans on any kind of movement, the domestic outside became a place of relentless policing. As part of its response to the spread of the virus, Municipal authorities assumed extraordinary powers and implemented strict containment measures. Among them was the sealing of slums, shawls, and buildings marked as containment areas. With this policy, the domestic outside, excuse me, with this policy, the domestic inside joined the domestic outside as target of intense pandemic policy. Independent of the size of the house and the number of inhabitants, 
Buildings in Mumbai with five or more positive cases were sealed for a minimum of two weeks with no person allowed to enter or exit except officials and medical professionals. Sealed buildings were marked off symbolically and became visible in neighborhoods because authorities put up, uh, put up barricades and large warning banners at the entrance. In dramatic performances of state power, buildings were locked without prior notice, making it difficult for people to procure groceries and prepare for an uncertain period of enforced quarantine. In some instances, buildings were locked multiple times because the virus kept spreading in the neighborhood. Over the course of the pandemic, thousands of housing compounds across the city were sealed. Uh, and I now want to share my screen, screen and show you a few pictures from Mumbai. Just give me a second. So I hope you are able now to see my screen. And I will not uh, comment the, the pictures. Uh, I just want to show them. Uh, and, and then the, the, the meaning and the relevance will become more clear in the course of the talk. So here you can see the containment zones uh, across the city at one particular point in time. So the policy of sealing triggered anger and frustration within neighborhoods often leading to accusations against hospital staff who tested positive and who were made responsible for the dramatic government intervention. Placed under collective quarantine for an undefined period of time and almost completely sealed off from the outside, solidarities within communities fractured. Due to their occupation, whether medical or not, Hospital staff were blamed for the containment measures and the radical restrictions. They were seen as a reason for the spread of the virus and the subsequent measures imposed by the government. It's because of your mother that we are locked in, up in the building, a neighbor complained to a 14-year-old daughter of Sunita, a Tata Hospital ward staff. As Sunita related to us, the mu mu municipal authorities just informed everyone that they will seal the building and they didn't give anyone an opportunity to get some groceries. They just went there and simply sealed the building. That was the main reason that everyone got very annoyed and angry because they went there without prior notice. Neighbors blamed Sunita, abused her and then ignored and avoided her. All the social pressure was on Sunita to return from the hospital isolation and provide a negative test report so that the building could be unlocked. When she tested negative, she pleaded to the local authorities to open up the building. However, when Sunita returned home, another person in the building tested positive and public health officials extended the containment. Officials informed Sunita that there was another case 
so they would keep the building sealed. This crushed everyone's hope of getting out. The people in the housing society blamed me and I had to listen to their abuses again, said Sunita. Spoken by individuals in a voice that embraces an anonymous discourse, Sunita's neighbors were upset that she had gone to the hospital to rest and recover from the disease. But because of her, we are facing the brunt of the burden and our building has been sealed. Neighbors requested that all these people working in the hospital should not be allowed to stay in the building because they return from the hospital after testing positive and then create problems for others. The blame, accusation, tension and harassment that hospital staff faced in their local communities articulated the broader suspicion that all the people working in the hospital bring disease along with them. Of course, disease here refers to more than just the virus. It also refers to that which comes along with the virus, namely the state. To prevent the appearance of the state in the community, people with symptoms increasingly abstained from testing. Anita, a trainee in Tata Memorial, lives with her parents and her four sisters in a chawl in a two bedroom apartment. Her neighbors taunted the family during the pandemic because they allowed their daughter to continue her training in the hospital for which she received a stipend on which the family income depended. You have a problem. You're so greedy for money that you have sent your daughter to the hospital and didn't think of us, they said. When Anita tested positive, the government authorities insisted that she be, she be quarantined in an isolation facility. In Manda's case, the municipal authorities locked the family inside the flat, nailing bamboo sticks across the door so that nobody could leave. They said they will come after 14 days and carry out tests, and only then will we be allowed to come out. They didn't provide any food and told us to eat whatever was there in the house. They nailed the sticks and went away. India is a country that knows how to police its people, but it, also, but it is also a society that knows how to practice hierarchy and distance. In a newspaper article, historian and novelist Mukul Kesavan wondered whether social distancing comes naturally to someone raised within a broadly Brahminical society with its extensive routines of purity and pollution and its elaborate techniques of avoiding proximity with untouchables. The concern with caste transgression manifests, for example, when hospital workers ask mortuary assistants to remain outside of the hospital premises. As Kesavan notes, caste society's gift for social distancing and exclusion serves Indian, Indians well in this season of infection. In India, the coronavirus is a polluting disease kept at bay by ritualized alertness. It is contained by avoiding proximity and through constant purification. It is a challenge that caste society was built to meet. Hospital staff who experienced social distancing and exclusion in the community drew on a lexicon of caste and compared their experience with the status of untouchables. Manisha, who works in the hospital as a clerk and who lives in a chawl in Paril, commented, we became like untouchables. The neighbors behaved like that with us. In Manisha's building, people avoided testing because of the fact that the municipal authorities would come and take people away and put them somewhere in an isolation center. As she emphasized, there was no fear of contagion, disease or death. Rather, the fear was of being admitted or put under quarantine. There was no fear of anything else. To call this experience a stigma and to place it next to other forms of stigmatization documented in other contexts and for other diseases creates false equivalences. It also obscures the stakes of each setting. In the case of the hospital staff, the stigma master concept 
draws attention to people who are associated with a disease because they work in a medical institution. But it fails to take into account the role of the state and the local community in creating a cascade of distancing effects. The key trigger for the cascade is not disease itself, but the state's appearance in the everyday life of the community. Across the city, this appearance and its effect are socially and geographically uneven. Manifestations of the state in local communities are driven by imaginations of dirt and density as pathology. What McFarlane terms the density pathology imaginary affected especially lower class and lower caste people living in crowded slum and chawl neighborhoods, people who are already subject to intense policing and who are already navigating difficult living and housing conditions that make existence a daily struggle. By placing hospital staff who tested positive under a locally enforced containment regime, neighbors in slums and chawls seemed to act like the state, turning into an extension of state power. Facing borders and boundaries imposed on them by officials, neighbors simultaneously opposed, circumvented, reproduced, and reinforced them locally. This is not behavior that is based on a false perception of disease. What we have here is something else. At stake is first, a social history of already existing segregation practices along linguistic, regional, re religious, caste, class, and gender divisions that mark everyday life in the local worlds of the slums and the chores. And second, how specific forms of urban governmentality appear in local milieus, are navigated and circumvented, and become intensified as retribution against those who are accused of being responsible for the state's drastic intervention that affects the entire community. Social distance, irritation, and harassment of hospital staff occur in communities of dense cohabitation that are marked by social and economic pressure and precarious living, and that are afraid of forced deportation into mass quarantine centers. This then is a second mirror, where local communities become mirrors of the state navigating, circumventing, implementing, and magnifying segregation measures that are imposed on them in the name of life, health, security, and order. The policy of sealing entire residential blocks marked off symbolically, not just individuals, but whole communities. Slums and chawls faced especially harsh government interventions of containment and confinement driven by upper class dirt and density fantasies and anxieties about the world of working class people who share a common toilet at the end of the corridor. Placed in an extreme condition of risk, security and control by government authorities, communities in sealed tenements singled out hospital staff through rumor and gossip and confined them and their families to a limited sociality in an already limited form of local domestic life. In some cases, boundaries were drawn even within family, even within the family, singling out the person working in the hospital as culprit for the limited sociality of the entire family imposed by the state and the local community. In such cases, the guilty person is socially distanced and excluded from all forms of collective life, including the city, the neighborhood, the house, the household, and the family. To call on the state to prevent stigmatization and educate the public has become a common theme in the health research literature. But this call seems ironic and naive in a context where social dis dissonance, irritation and harassment occur because of the state's presence. These forms of re retribution and social bordering are clearly not motivated by people's false perceptions of disease. And they are not simply locatable in the, in the in individuals who lack proper education. Instead, they are first part of a broader system of knowledge and power with modern statecraft firmly at its center. And second, driven by principles of social stratification and distancing that already mark the everyday life of local communities. <clears throat> 
Stigma is a bordering mechanism and must thus be seen as a continuation of the state's own deployment of borders and boundaries as techniques of governing infectious disease. By creating borders and boundaries and regulating the movement of people, the state controls access to mobility. What is termed stigma is not a response to difference, driven by a fear of difference. The simplistic social psychology inspired by Goffman is misleading. Instead, stigma is a side of struggle for access to mobility in a context of rigorous regulation, stratification, and confinement. As long as we continue to deploy stigma as a master concept that can capture almost any kind of negative social experience that creates false equivalences across settings and that naturalizes and dehistoricizes what it describes, we are at risk of unseeing how the forces of science, medicine, and the state are complicit in the very crime they presumably oppose. So thank you very much for um, uh, bearing with me. Um, Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Carlo, for that bracing and powerful um, presentation. There's, there's, a, there's much to think about. Um, and uh, uh, Carlo's talk is now uh, open to responses, questions. Uh, if you do have a comment or a question, uh, please raise your electronic hand so that I can, I can see you in queue. Um, um, So Carlo, while, while, while um, our audience is thinking through your presentation, um, okay, there's, there's China. Okay, I'll ask my question after China. Okay, go ahead. You're welcome to go ahead if no, you no, like. No, no, please, please. Well, I just um, really wanna thank you for that, Carlo, um, both in terms of what the earlier conceptual section of the paper did in, in understanding the situation around stigma in the state in India in the later half, um, I also found this talk really productive, given a recent um, journal, journal manuscript review experience I had in which um, some colleagues and I working on Hep C in far southwest Virginia um, had developed a set of arguments around the idea of the uncanny only to have reviewers say, this, is, this sounds like stigma, you should be using Goffman, this should be about stigma, and sort of that process of um, wanting to categorize something with a concept that is already sort of immediately recognizable and universal and far less specific, and thus I think far less useful in terms of really understanding the specificity of human experience. And so I was just wondering in terms of your arguments around um, normal science, how you think about the question of um, the review process, peer review, both in terms of uh, granting agencies, journals, books, whatnot, um, and how social scientists might be able to push back effectively against the um, sort of over, over use or sort of over general use of specific concepts. And in this case, actually this particular concept. Uh, th thanks very much, uh, China. I think, you know, that's, that's precisely one of the, the, the key questions and one of the key problems that I'm trying to identify. I mean, as you, as you were describing, that's why this concept is so powerful because it is so common because it is you know used so often um and and because it provide provides this sense of understanding right as soon as you apply stigma you think you've understood what you know what, what you've been describing as a stigma but i've been what i've been trying to 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 show in in the, the first two parts is um that there is not much interest in trying to use different vocabularies or different languages or you know different analytics to understand what, what's going on and 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 the real problem is that if you're not abandoning this kind of language of, of stigma that has become so common it gets really difficult to understand why it is happening and 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 you know what, what we're seeing in the in the first place so I think it's really urgent to push against the concept of stigma to multiply the kinds of languages that are available in order to talk about, you know, what is called stigma, right? I'm not saying that the things are not happening, right? I'm just saying 
you know, the concept is problematic and obscures more than, than what it reveals. Um, so, but as, as you were saying, you know, the, the review process is precisely one of these mechanisms that reinforce the power and the creative power of these, of these concepts. Thank you, Carla, just really helpful. Yeah, thanks, Carlo and 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 China. Um, uh, Carlo, uh, I it it was very very um, um, uh, you know um, edifying to hear um, how you connected um, stigma to this paradigm of normal science uh, and and the question of you know more information, which which kind of invests in this narrative of scientific progress, science, science scientism that the more empirical evidence people have and the more they engage with evidence, somehow we'll be, be more knowledgeable about things. And, and uh, given that this, um, your talk also features in a series called Futurities, where we've been thinking about, you know, dissonant paradigms, just different ways of imagining um, uh, time in a non-linear way, where the future no longer signifies a, a kind of uh, um, um, a leap into uh, a, another narrative of progress, another narrative of infinite time into the future, but rather foreclosed futures, rather uh, thinking futures in relation to other time frames, the evolutionary time, geological time, and so on. So, so uh, I just wanted to invite you to uh, think or, or, or share with us how you imagine even the parad thinking of paradigms, scientific paradigms in, in these modes and whether you feel pessimistic or optimistic about even where some of the foundational assumptions of science and technology studies are, are, are keeping pace uh, with in some ways the crisis of imagining time in the future, if just an invitation with some thoughts. It, it is a, it's a great question and, and a, a really huge one and an important one, right? Um, you know, as, as I was trying to explain in, in the, the first part, in, in a sense, this kind of health research has a future precisely because it doesn't have one. If we mean a future in, in the sense of an open horizon or, you know, trying to do something where you don't already know what it is and where it will be going and what it will achieve. Um, so, so this is a future that is just, you could call it just reproduction, right? The same thing is being reproduced. Um, the same articles, the same arguments, the same methods um, is just applied in different contexts and, and for different diseases. And, and that's how this type of science uh, creates a future for itself and, and continues to progress in the sense of progression that it you know, entails and that is embedded in, in that. Now to, to, to shift that, you, you have to introduce a whole, uh, you know, some, some dissonance and, and you have to question the very assumptions and grounds on which it is proceeding. And, and, and then you can open up a horizon that maybe then it becomes possible to think about the world in, in different terms. And that of course means that you have to take a risk, right? Because you don't know what will be the concept, what will be the language. And what will be the implications of that language? What will that analysis do in the world if you see the world in this particular frame? Um, that is always a risk. Um, but I think we have to take that risk um, precisely be, 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 because in the context of stigma research, in the context where it operates as a normal science, uh, it, it increasingly operates completely independent of the world that is trying to, to examine. Um, so, so that's one thing. The, the other thing, as I was trying to underscore, is the, the politics um, of this kind of frame and, and this kind of language, right? Because what happens is that, on the one hand, within this framework, within this language of stigma, it becomes impossible to see how medicine itself is um, complicit with the very thing it is trying to oppose. But it is also writing the state out of the narrative. And I think that's something very dangerous. And that's something that we as anthropologists definitely want to avoid. So it's important to write state, power, and knowledge, and history back into 
these scenes that we are analyzing and exploring um, because sure. they're really driving forces. Thank you. Thank you, Carlo. So we have um, two other um, hands up. Avilasha Ghosh, can we see you? We, we can't hear you. Okay. okay. Uh, can you hear me now? Um, yes. So and, 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 and would you uh, introduce yourself? That would be wonderful. Oh, I'm so sorry. Yeah. So I am uh, basically uh, from IIT Delhi in India, and I'm doing my project in IIT. I'm a PhD scholar in my third year, and I'm hoping to work with Dr. Kardav soon. Okay. So, um, yes. Well, thank you so much for organizing this talk, and I'm so glad I can be here um, and be a part of this. I just had a question. Um, actually, I don't know if it's a question. It's more of um, something I thought this um, particular lecture made me think about is when we are look. Uh, so, so you had talked about um, the idea of how, you know, the idea of stigma is so much, uh, I'm so sorry, like I have to frame it better. So I'm just trying to make, uh, yeah. So I was trying to say that the idea of stigma in uh, the normal science, the way we see it happening in the kind of uh, news articles we read about the stigma associated with COVID and the protocols of social distancing. And like you showed us images of the containment zones and how there was no uh, prior information or time given to people. So if stigma is a form of, um, is a way of the state to legitimize certain forms of control and also uh, to use fear and protocol as a way to consistently um, perpetrate stigma through writing and interventions of the state. Can we also then look at um, some of the ways in which the state pacifies individuals into um, certain situations um, or to perpetrate further stigma also as a way of like a state mechanism? Because I have noticed that in India, during the COVID-19 pandemic, there were a lot of people, um, the state was under-reporting COVID cases. And um, there was a lot of under-reporting that was going on and they were hiding the numbers to pacify uh, individuals. And uh, there was so much stigma around it uh, because uh, there was under-reporting and that is why the civil society kind of uh, came about to help out certain sections of the population in these containment areas and you know, with uh, different kinds of sanitizers, masks and other forms of initiatives. So would you see uh, pacification uh, as a tool to perpetrate further uh, control and, you know, like stigma in a way through the state medium? I don't know if I'm clear though, in my question. Oh, that, that makes total sense. Uh, thanks, Avilasha. Um, see, there's an irony here um, because even the state, the Indian state responded, you know, to this epidemic of uh, stigma against healthcare workers, um, and and it 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 in in April two thousand and twenty, it uh, amended the um, Epidemic Disease Act, um, and and made uh, stigma against healthcare workers a crime. Right now, what what you need to know is that the the Epidemic Diseases Act is a colonial law. It was it was um, uh, it, it was. Uh, it, um, uh, it, it was. Uh, it, it goes back to the to the to, to the British um, to the late nineteenth century in eighteen ninety seven. It was um, um, put into law, uh, and, and it's still the uh, major legislation that allows uh, Indian authorities to intervene in the context of, of, of the epidemic. So we have actually a colonial law uh, that has become the, the legal foundations for the, the Indian state's government response to, to the pandemic, a law from the 19th century, um, implemented by the British in, in response to the plague uh, outbreaks that happened in the late 19th century. Now, as, 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 as you may know, the, 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 this law is actually not really focused on epidemic diseases. It has nothing to do with disease. It's about policing of populations and people. And so that is basically the legal framework within which the Indian government has been responding to the pandemic, which has been mainly one of, of policing, policing people, policing populations, po policing movements, and, and so on. Now, the irony is, of course, that now the violence, not, as I've been explaining, you know, this law and, and the government intervention is a key context within which uh, the harassment of the healthcare workers has happened, right? And so it's both that which has 
in a sense been the context for the stigma, but then it also becomes for the state another opportunity to extend its powers of policing and to consolidate its own power. So in that sense, stigma has become an opportunity for the state to affirm uh, this colonial law and to even ex extend even more its powers of, of policing. And so that's a huge irony. And again, that's something that is being made invisible by a stigma discourse that uh, consistently writes the state out of the narrative. Thank you. Thanks, Avilasha. And Ira, question from you. Thank you so much, Carla. That was a wonderful talk that was like really provocative and interesting. I'm not a medical anthropologist, I'm a cultural anthropologist, but I'm also interested in the history and philosophy of science and STS, and that was really great. So I wanna uh, just, I wanna push on two things though. One is the critique of normal science and one is about Goffman. So, I mean, so normal science got a really bad name after um, after Kuhn named it in some sense and created the category in just the same way that you're talking about stigma. And I'm not, you know, I, I'm not sure normal science is necessarily bad, nor is, I mean, so there's two issues involved. One is the lumping quality of a category, right? Lumping versus splitting. So, so much is being lumped together in stigma. And the other is the what you just said, that the, the, the category picked up by health sciences writes the state out of the narrative. So it takes the state as the solution, not the, not the problem. And I you know, totally, I, I love that part. It actually, it relates to a lot of stuff in development studies where, you know, it's always awareness campaigns and the state and so on. Um, but just to, okay, so what, so I get what's wrong with that, but what's wrong with the lumping quality of having a broad category per se, or of doing normal science per se? And just if you could permit me one more thing would be to tie it to Goffman. So Goffman, Goffman himself, so to speak, did not in the, in the essay on stigma focus so much on the state or institutions, like powerful institutions sort of are, come in a little bit in some of the examples, but we know that Goffman, you know, is sort of like looking at Goffman as a whole, like Goffman was profoundly interested in the role of the state and institutions as sort of part of the social process by which these identities are created, you know, in the, in, in the asylum and, and, and uh, in his work on, you know, footing and, and um, presentation of self. And so you could say that you know, in some broader sense, like Goffman would not have, you know, smiled on the idea of a, of a, um, of a concept of, of stigma that was shorn of, of the, of the effect of powerful institutions, uh, even though, and maybe, you know, even though he clearly was interested in lumping together, you know, in some sense, like creating a, a sort of overarching commonality. So what, at that sort of higher level of, of generality in the critique, that in some sense you're posing a critique, there's the problem of the state, but then at a higher level, you're posing the critique of you know, generalization and normal science as such. Why? What's wrong with it? Well, well in, a, I mean, in a sense, you could say that all the problems that I've been discussing are already present in Goffman and in, in, in the way in which Goffman approaches the, the question of stigma, but they become even more problematic in the you know in the health research work that takes Goffman as a kind of starting point, but doesn't really engage with it in, in a more serious or, or critical way. So, so in a sense, it's also a kind of simplistic reading of Goffman that then creates the problems that I've been describing. But the, 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 the foundation of these problems is, is in, in Goffman precisely because he's lumping together, you know, a whole range of different categories of people. When you're reading the book from today's perspective, I mean, it's just kind of mind blowing. I mean, he's talking about deaf people and he's talking about blind people and he's talking about divorced people and he's talking about criminals and then he's talking about epileptics and then he's, it's just, you know, <laughs> just a really, 
amazing assemblage of, of people that we would no, not necessarily put into the same box. So we would at least ask the question, how can you put all of these people into the same box? But the, the second problem is that he's never, that he's taking this idea of difference for granted and he's not looking at the history of that difference. And especially he's not looking at the distinction between the normal and the pathological, which is clearly a 19th century invention as we know from Congolians and Foucault's work and so on. So, so, and because, precisely because he doesn't really keep the, the question of difference separate from the question of the normal and, and, and the abnormal, um, it, it, it really becomes, becomes problematic because, because, you know, as, as we know from a lot of research, we want to know something about how these grammars of difference have emerged, how they have changed and, and how they're connected with particular institutions. Um, yeah, and, and you know how they, what consequences they had, they had, and, and how people have taken up these um, th these distinctions and 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 refused them, and etc. So all of that is not necessarily necessarily present in, in in government's work, but it's it's really crucial that you're not on the one hand universalizing the question of difference. And generalizing it, uh, and that you're bringing in history and, and power into the conversation, um, because only then these things appear as contingent, right? So I guess I agree with you. You, you could do a critical reading of Goffman that brings it into the contemporary, and, and that would kind of you know save it in, in in some sense. But that's not what's happening in the health research literature. It has a very kind of narrow understanding of government and then just continues to reproduce the, the problems that are already there. They're not thickening it, they're thinning it. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Ira. And uh, uh, so, so Carlo, we have about three minutes, but I can't resist since you, you talked about India and, and you, you weighed in with Mukul Kesavan writing about, it was a terrible piece by Mukul Kesavan, by the way. I mean, it, it was controversial. Uh, and, and for the, for one of the reasons is that it, you know, he, he, in a very kind of ham-handed way, just typically touched on what was you know, not thought through, and I've written a book on caste, so I'm, I'm kind of coming from a position where I, I have researched issues of caste untouchability and, 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 and there was a suddenly an imposition of, a, of, a, of India just seeing, being seen through the prism of caste. Suddenly all this contact, you know, questions of purification, stigma, automatically that register transferred to caste without realizing that in a city in Bombay, first of all, the, uh, people don't have the luxury to socially distance, irrespective of one's caste identity. That's a fact, it's, and especially in tenements, in slums. And you know, a social distancing is a luxury. So it is, it is total, I think it's, there's a real problem in saying that, oh, suddenly, you know, people are aware of their, you know, social, yeah, they, 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 thousands of years of practice of untouchability and so on. I take the, I completely take the point about certain groups of people being stigmatized and some of those old narratives coming back, whether it is those who handled diseased and dead bodies, um, workers and, you know, I, I completely get that. Um, but I think one has to be, even when one wants to bring you know, cultural and social nuance and histories of power. Uh, I just think it's a comment. Uh, you don't have to respond to it, but I had, I wanted to register some unease with, with a mode of analysis that suddenly falls back on this large category, uh, an optic by which India is seen, a society of hierarchy, as if no hierarchy exists in other societies, you know? Uh, yeah? No, no, I completely agree with, with, with your, with your point, and, and I mean, I, I wanted to make two things, uh, or I wanted to discuss two things. One thing is, in the interviews that we did and the conversations that we had with people, we, we often saw that people would use the language of caste and of untouchability in order to understand and explain their experiences that they 
made within within these neighborhoods in the sense that they were saying we were treated as if we were untouchables. So clearly for, for, for people, this was a kind of language that was available and that made cultural sense in order to express um, the experience of um, exclusion and discrimination, et cetera, that, 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 they've, that they've made. Um, so, so in that sense, that was just um, one point. But the second point that I wanted to, to make is, and I agree with you, I mean, caste is just one principle of social stratification. Um, and, and so it's important to, to place it within and in the context of other principles of social stratification, uh, you know, being according to linguistic um, divisions or religious divisions or class divisions, gender divisions, etc. I mean, there's, there's a whole, um, I guess, you know, element in, in terms of, as, as you probably realized, all the, the people I, I, I cited and I referenced are women. And so the, the whole question of how women were particularly um, subject to harassment, to irritation, et cetera, is, is a whole other question. And how women had to justify their work in the hospital during the pandemic, where people were saying, well, you should be at, at home, you should be a housewife, why are you going, uh, doing this work, it's dangerous, et cetera. So they had to kind of justify, re-justify and re-legitimize their work in the hospital. Um, and, and that is of course something that men experience much less. So yeah, that is just to say, I would place the question of caste within this whole other important principles of social stratification and social distancing that are already operating in very complex ways in different communities. And as you were saying, in different ways in, in a city like Bombay. So uh, thank you so much, Carlo. We are we could have we, there's so much to talk about, and I hope we can continue some of this conversation at the workshop tomorrow. But please join me in thanking thanking Carlo for uh, just a very rich uh, and as I said, bracing presentation. There's so much to think about, uh, and uh, look forward to uh, seeing you tomorrow. And Ira and China, if you can encourage more of your students to come to the workshop tomorrow, that would be great. Yeah, okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Debjani, and th thanks, thanks everyone for the great conversation.